Mike Show, and my name is Avram Rosenzweig, and I'm really, really happy to be here, um, in particular because I am so excited about my guest today, Rabbi Shlomo Gomorrah. We will get to that in one second and to him. Uh, the show is all about fascinating people who have uh, in inspiring stories to share with us. Uh, in the past, take a look at uh, some of the interviews that I've done. You can find them on YouTube. You can find them on Facebook and other such social media outlets. A few weeks ago, I interviewed Hillel Halkin, who is uh, world-renowned, uh, certainly Israeli-renowned, uh, translator and author, brilliant, brilliant fellow, who has hobnobbed with all the great literary giants uh, in the Jewish world. And if not spent time with them because they're not here on our earth anymore, he has translated their stories. Uh, last week, I interviewed Rabbi Karopkin from the Bayat Synagogue here in Toronto. Rabbi Karopkin, also a very erudite fellow, has translated a book or a sefer, a Jewish Jewish Torah book, called the Kuzari. And he's one of the only ones who has translated. Um, and we had a discussion about this very quirky book, uh, which was written by Rabbi Yehuda Levi in the uh, 12th century. And it was basically a dialogue between a king and a, a Jewish scholar about the credence given to the Jewish faith and the importance of it, and was written right around a time when philosophy, Greek philosophy, was really making its way into all the corners of the world, and in particular the Jewish world. So that's why the Kuzari was written. Lots of great stories, lots of great interviews, and today we have another one um, with Rabbi Shlomo Gomorrah. Rabbi Shlomo Gomorrah is a uh, Israeli-born uh, rabbi and teacher. He was born in Petach Tikva. And uh, early on, he discovered a great passion for teaching. And he came here as a shaliach, which is an emissary uh, for Israel, for the Jewish people, um, and went back to Israel, but decided he liked it a lot. So he came back. He became the Rosh Yeshiva of uh, Or Chaim, which is a uh, Mizrahi Yeshiva. That's the head of a Talmudic school, and ultimately uh, ended up at one of the world's biggest, if not the biggest, Jewish high school is called Chad here in Toronto, and there is the vice uh, principal. He is an Agnon specialist. We'll explain what that means to you shortly. And he's a friend of mine, and he's a lovely guy. Welcome, Rabbi Gamora. Thank you very much, Abram. I'm, I'm very humbled that you invited me because I see the caliber of the people uh, who were already on the show, and I feel a little bit uh, unfit. Well, that's point. why that's why I invited you. <laughs> Because you're so humble, and yet I don't know. In my mind, and in the minds of many people, you are a uh, just a fine, fine human being and a Torah scholar, and also you're a very quirky man. I like your quirkiness. Thank you. You're welcome, R Rabbi. Your name is Gamora. Well, what is, is that? What is that? Was that on your father's birth certificate? Absolutely. Um, and you know what? This is a mystery. It's uh, first of all, I find it like a great topic to discuss because people say Gamora. Is it real? Is it true? And yeah. it's very true. Um, um, my father um, had this name, my grandfather, who I knew from my father's side, uh, bear his name. And you know, the funny thing, when I came in 93 to Toronto, a person in Clandon Park School came to me and said, you are the grandson of Shlomo Gemara? I said, well, I don't think so. <laughs> he said, because I knew from Poland, um, a, a whole family of Gemara. Are you a Cohen? He asked me, and I said yes. He said you should know. I knew this uh, area in um, in Poland. It's uh, it's called Cherbin, and I actually knew a person by the name Shlomo Gemara. I was completely like uh, I never heard about it, and um, my name Shlomo uh, comes from my uh, mother's name, <clears throat> my mother's uh, side, um, which is interesting by itself. Because you know, I want I want to open and <clears throat> and ask you a question of room. What is your greatest decision about your life that you ever made? I just wonder, like, if you can say about something that was the greatest decision that influenced your life. Having a child for me, yeah, yeah. So I, I'll tell you what is the greatest decision for me, and it actually was not made by me. It was made fifteen years before before I was born. My um. A grandparents, they lived in um, Brussels in Belgium, and unfortunately, they were taken in the second last 
a transport from Bristol to Auschwitz. At the night before they um, were supposed to, uh, to go to the train, uh, my grandfather made um, a horrible decision. Uh, he decided to leave my mother with a Christian family. And by this, he saved her. And that's why I came to the world. You know, for 40 years, there is no one day that I don't think about the courage of making such a decision. Because later we learned that uh, in this transport, there were many children. Uh, what, what parent will leave his child behind? Uh, and they did not know exactly what is uh, awaiting for them. So I'm very proud to uh, bear his name, uh, Shlomo. His name was Shlomo Majewski. And um, I don't cease, even for one day, as I say, uh, to think about uh, the fact that um, he, the reason why I'm here, and his decision was the most important decision for my life that I had nothing to do with. It was like, you know... This way or this way, uh, and, and I'm pretty sure that they, they were torn by making this decision. I, I don't want to think like how the discussion between my grandfather and grandmother looked like the night before they were transported to Auschwitz. Do you feel that's a mystical thing, that decision made? Do you feel that it was something which was godly in nature? Absolutely, yes. How does that Absolutely, play out? Yes, how does that play out? You know what? I, I don't think that everyone at the time could rationalize it. Yeah. I'm sure that maybe people, many people would critique it, uh, criticize it. Um, I, I simply don't know. I think it's kind of inspiration of a moment. And, you know, at the same time, as I said, in this transport, uh, many children were taken and turned to ashes like my grandparents. Have you ever made me, you asked me the questions, what the biggest decisions of my life? What was the biggest decision of your life? So as I said, the, the biggest decision was not made by me. What was made by my grandfather 15 years before I was born in, in 44. Um, then decisions, I would say for sure to come to Canada. Yeah. That, um influenced my life um, in, a, in a big way. And as you said, I came as a shaliach. And I went back actually to Israel and came back after yeah. two years. Um, and yes, for sure, this is uh, like my life is shaped by this decision. No, no question about it. You know, Rabbi, since I've known you and I've known you for a number of years, you knew my mother of blessed memory, my family. Um, when I think of Israel, who personifies Israel, I think of you, really. You're, you're erudite in an Israeli sort of way. You're very culturally uh, Israeli. You're, you're imbued and ensconced in Torah and Jewish life. Why did you stay here? Um, that's a great question. Yes. And, <laughs> you know, I, I feel like I'm in a therapy, which is good, by the way. You, that's you, what you, I do. You know that's what I do. Very, yeah. very well of them. yeah, thank you. Um, I would say that... I had to be in Canada, and I'll explain what I mean. Because in a very young age, I started to be open to many, many opinions, many people who are different than me, and I appreciated it. Uh, I appreciated people that I don't agree with, but they have something to say. They, they did something magnificent. Uh, I went to the army. Maybe we'll talk about it a little bit later. And I started to see that the world is much more than the people I met until... I was 18 years old and I was reading like from a very young age, I must say that. And you know, the books that the Gnon say, instead of flying all over the world, the world comes to you. Yes. And it's a great feeling. Like I read a lot and I really wanted to experience what is the world, the, the biggest uh, um, adventure of my life. And I always wanted to experience something different. And when um, a, Rabbi Felix, who was here at Rosh Hashiva, called me in Israel and said, I want you to go to Toronto, I think I was ready for this. Um, I went to my wife and I said, I think it's a great opportunity sent by Hashem. I want, I would like to, uh, to try it. And that's how we found ourselves here. 
What was it like? Do you remember what it was like adjusting to the culture? Because, you know, the Israelis call us, an, I believe the word is adin or adishim, like very soft. Culturally, we're dramatically different than Israel. And a proof of that, as my sister was talking to me yesterday, about a Canadian who is a chayal, who is a soldier in Israel right now, and he's having a very, very difficult time, obviously, fighting, as the Israelis are, but he even more so. And that's because he was born in Canada. In Canada, we're not threatened by external forces very much at all. Our challenges are usually from within. So what was it like for you to acclimatize? Um, Beyond all expectations, I was um, uh, welcomed by a very warm community. We felt at home almost uh, at the first moment. Um, the community that I belong to, the community of Orheim, uh, was amazing to, to us as a family. The people were extremely nice. I'm sorry to admit, but we had no difficulties to immerse into the Canadian culture okay, okay. <laughs> very, very easily and very nicely. Um, and, you know, at the beginning, you, you are so excited, you forget what yes. is the toll you pay for it, which is like a little disconnect from your family, from your friend. Uh, this usually comes after a few years. You start to realize that if you enjoy life here and you are happy about what you are doing, you lose something very significant in your life. The, the tie that I formed uh, before, family, friends, and things are happening in life. And um, uh, when you make a decision to be in a different place, that means that you are going to lose upon many connections and ties that you had before. Rabbi, here in Canada or in Toronto, we apologize a lot. We're consistently saying, I'm sorry, not only to human beings, but if you bump into a chair, I've seen people apologize to the chair. Israelis don't do that. What, what would you say were one of the character traits that you have that you had to adjust in order to make yourself a good Canadian? Um, exactly as you said. Um, you know, to say sorry for everything and... Um, to be nice and sometimes to, you know, to round the, the corners, if it's parents or students or others, uh, it took us some time. Uh, sometimes uh, the Israeli within me sprang out, I must say, until this very moment. Uh, but you learn to be a little bit softer. Um, and, and by the way, it's not that I was that tough before, but certainly I had to, um, to learn a few things. So recently you went back to Israel to see your mother who wasn't well. Thank God. Am I correct? Right. Mal right. Yeah. Malka, yeah. Okay. Very good. When you go back, you also have three siblings. When you go back to Israel, do they, or did they comment on, Oh, Shlomo, you, you seem so different now or, or were you pretty much intact? No, I, I never heard these uh, comments to be honest. Um, again, um, I did not change much from within. It's more like the certain uh, behavioral yeah. codes that you have to adopt. Uh, you cannot be dugri, as we say it in Hebrew, you know, like straightforward to your face. Um, but again, I, I don't think that before I was that like, wow, in your face, I don't care what you think. Um, I was a little bit softer, but I became even more softer. Rabbi, as I said, you were born in Israel in Petach Tikva. In 1973, the war broke out. You were in grade nine at that time. Um, and you were asked if you could act as a teacher because many of the teachers were in the army, were, in, uh, were fighting the war, and we find that today similarly. You said that you, were, you, you thought it would be a lot of fun, so you decided to do it. Um, and indeed, uh, once you had done it, you said it was absolutely wonderful. Do you remember those days? What, what was absolutely... so wonderful? What was so wonderful about teaching? <laughs> I'll start a little bit before. I, I had a very happy childhood. I must say that I, I grew up in uh, Tel Aviv um, yeah. until I was in grade one, and then I came to Petah Tikva, which was then a young city um, uh, for people who cannot, who could not, I, I guess, uh, afford a house or apartment in Tel Aviv. So. This became the suburbs of uh, Tel Aviv. I had wonderful friends around me, and I had a great school, Netzach Israel, that today I know was the first elementary Dati school in Israel ever. 
Um, I, I never knew it as a student, but uh, this school had uh, history. And I was a good student. And um, when we went to grade nine, I learned in uh, Yeshivat Nechalim. This is a Yeshiva high school, not far away from Petah Tikva. And, you know, I can tell you just about the day we, we stayed in the Yeshiva on Yom Kippur, how the, the war broke out uh, unexpectedly, obviously, and we went home. And I had a principal that wanted all the students to come after the uh, break of Sukkot of 73 to come back to the yeshiva. And we came to the yeshiva. Um, and let me tell you, we had no teachers, number one. So the, the one teacher took us to the Beit Midrash to learn for a stay there, and we tried to learn something in the afternoon. Uh, but I remember this time uh, mostly playing basketball uh, in, the, in the court. And then my previous principal, Dr. Levy, called me and he said, we need teachers. We need teachers. I said, are you kidding me? I'm in grade nine. Like, what, what do you want me to teach? 14 said, years old. Yeah, just come. We will arrange it. And you know what? I thought it will be nice um, for my experience. And you know how how many days you can play basketball from day to night. So I thought it will be like a nice change. And um, I went to teach. And they gave me grade five. And I asked him, what did he say? Whatever, just keep them in the <laughs> class. <laughs> um, and I could see Israelis saying it like that. Oh, yeah, yeah. He, like, like, <laughs> like curriculum, the word curriculum I learned only when I came to Canada. You ask about like different, like teach them whatever you want. Okay, so I started, I think, with teaching Torah and Rashi. I decided on Parshat Shavua to take like beautiful pieces of Rashi. Let me tell you, it didn't work well. And then, um, because I was a reader, um, I took a, a book which, based on all kinds of stories from the Talmud, from the Midrash, beautiful stories. And you know what? It was like a, a, a miracle. The class was silent. I remember that uh, in the first day, the principal went by, he looked into the class, understood what's going on, but for him, it was quite an achievement that the students were there and not all yeah, over. Yeah, yeah. The second day when he came, I remember he stood next to the door and like was staying for 10 minutes. And I was thinking like, what, 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 what is going wrong? What am and I doing he, wrong? Yeah. yeah. And then he came to me, he said, you know, the previous teacher was never able to uh, to have 10 minutes like this. <laughs> I said, apparently, he didn't tell them a story. And by the way, I learned quite a lot from this um, uh, experience. Uh, we all love stories. Uh, messages of stories are going straight to your mind and to your heart. Yes. Um, and when you try to teach something different, if you don't turn it to a story it will be much harder to teach. You know, Rabbi, my friend Ellie Rubenstein, who has also been a co-host on this show with me, he and I have known each other for, since our yeshiva days many, many years ago. He told me, he said, when he first began as a spiritual leader at Congregation Habonim, he would get up there and he would, in an erudite way, present halacha, present Jewish law, and, and, and you know, some of the intricacies of Talmud and so on. He said he would look out and he see everybody nodding off. <laughs> so what he decided to do instead was to start telling stories. And to this day, that's what he does. He has 2,000 stories in his head. Another thing that you, you, uh, you were quoted as saying is that, especially as vice, vice principal at Chad and as a teacher there, that humor is a very big deal in your teaching, right? I don't plan it, but I take things... With humor. I think the whole approach of humor means, first of all, you don't think yourself as such an important guy that uh, cannot laugh with your student, number one. Uh, it doesn't take anything from your ego or um, presence, maybe the opposite. And number two, it listen, there is a, a natural barrier between a student and a teacher. Yes. Uh, they don't see your personal side. They know that you are knowledgeable, uh, they know that um, you impart some knowledge and understanding uh, to them. 
but they don't see you as a human being. Yeah. And you may have a wonderful way to bridge this gap. Like, wow, this this guy can be funny. This guy, this guy can laugh at himself or at other people. So, of course, as long as the uh, borders are clear and we don't has uh, shalom like um, uh, affecting any other person or his uh, dignity or honor, um, you may have a, a, a great impact on students and teachers. Does does a joke come to mind? That's a, that's a too difficult one. Um, but I, I'll tell you one thing, not jokes. Uh, the, the, I, I got few uh, presents from my students over the years. Yeah. And um, a, interestingly enough, it happened to me, I was a teacher in Kibbutz Yavne um, about 35 years ago. And I was a teacher here in chat. And in four occasions, two in Israel and two and two here, at the end of the year, my students gave me a notebook with all the jokes and the things that they thought were funny and handed it to me. And to <laughs> me, this is the most wonderful um, a gift I ever got from my students. Um, and apparently it had some influence on them. I always tell them, please, please, Remember the Rashi and the Tospo. Don't remember the joke. But yes. you know what? Unfortunately, it's like a sermon. The rabbi can talk wonderfully. What people take is the the one joke. So I'm sorry that I did not prepare any joke, but um, you, you get the idea. It's an interesting thing about jokes. When you're called upon to give a joke, it's very difficult to sort of draw them out of your brain. <clears throat> Excuse me, out of your brain, right? I get that. Right. Rabbi, I, w- I, w- I want to go from the funny and the light to, to something. And, and again, I, you know, I, I just want to, to say one thing. A good joke is a, a joke that is unprepared. It just come out of the situation and, you know, it's like a line. It's a punch, spontaneous. It's a, yes. Yeah, exactly. So that's why I, I don't prepare jokes when I come to the to the class. OK, well, very one, nice. one, listen, one joke that I told them and they were uh-huh. really yeah. laughing. You know, my my beard used to be much uh, longer. So when I came to class, I knew that the students will ask what happened. So I told them that um, when I went to Yorkdale, it was like uh, about a month ago, uh, I got sick from all the kids who asked me, what am I going to bring them for Christmas? <laughs> so <laughs> so I cut a little bit my beard. It's not the yes. real story, by the way. But <laughs> I, could, I could see you being Santa Claus at Christmas time. Yeah. I've actually done that, by the way. My friend Marty and I, we were called upon to come down to a, uh, a shelter for kids and we were asked to be Santa Claus. So I said, okay, why not? And it was fun. I was a good Santa Claus. So Listen, ra- can, I, can I share with you one story? Yeah, please. It I'd love you to. Me in uh, the winter of 94, I believe. Um, I went to the mall uh, on Lawrence and the Allen Road. Remember this mall? Yeah, I don't sure. know if it's still active. I wasn't there for a long time. Anyway, they had a huge Christmas tree, and I went by, and the Santa Claus next to the Christmas tree who <laughs> take uh, pictures, he t- he like sees me and said, uh, <laughs> and I said, what? <laughs> what do you mean, <laughs> It's like, uh, you, you are a Jew? So he said, I'm a Russian Jew. I need money. He said, if they would uh, uh, pay well, I will be Jesus Christ. <laughs> we we truly are a light into the nation, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> so if you talk about like like cultural shocks, this yeah. was one of them. R- Rabbi, years ago the Pope came to the Dufferin Park, not far from where we are. Yeah. Thousands and thousands of people there. So being the good Jew that I am, I wanted to go hear the Pope. I thought he's so close, I have to go hear him. Fascinating individual, although you know, certainly his history is not entirely in sync with we as Jews, that being said. So I went. Anyways, this the Pope. Is the, Polish, uh, the Polish Pope. The Polish right? Pope. Or, right. Yeah. The Polish. So the, so, so the Pope is about to speak. And uh, everybody gets quiet. You know, you're in an environment, thousands of people. You could hear a pin drop. Except one guy is walking around. He's going, 
Pope buttons. I got Pope ribbons here. Come, you can buy a Pope fudgicle. I call him over. I go, you know, maybe you should have a little respect for the Pope. He's about to speak. And, uh, you know, you be, I'm sure you're being Catholic and all. He goes, oh, no, no, I'm not Catholic. He goes, I'm Jewish. I said, oh, okay, go do your business. <laughs> Rabbi, I want to I wanna get a little bit maudlin here, a, l- a little yeah. bit serious. As I said, you were in Israel a short while ago to see your dear mother. God bless her. She should be well. Uh, you have siblings uh, in Israel. And uh, as an Israeli and as a Jew and as a committed strong Jew, I want to ask you, October 7th happened. I want to ask you what your response was to that in your mind, in your brain, to your students. And also the, the second question is, we'll pile them on here, is you were in the army. You were at San Khan, a paratrooper. Can you give us a little bit of insight into what's going on in the minds of our 18-year-old, 19-year-old, 20-year-old Israeli brothers and sisters who are right now smack in the middle of Gaza um, fighting a war that is very bloody, that is very dangerous. So those two questions. Okay, I will start from uh, October the 7th. Actually, I happened to be in Israel um, uh, on Simchat Torah. And um, my grandchildren, I was hosted nicely, of course, by my son, uh, Netanel, uh, in Yerushalayim. He lives, uh, by the way, one uh, house. He lives on uh, Aza, 35 uh, or 37 i'm sorry and bb on 35 so in the middle of everything you know um and my my grandchildren like knock on the door at um 7 45 uh, azaka azaka there is uh, a siren and what like mazaka like tseba adom tseba adom okay so we went we were 15 people in the uh, apartment, and we run into the mamad, you know, this protected room that uh, supposed to um, uh, survive even um, a missile uh, attack. And it really hit me um, strongly. I remember when my son, another son, Elishiv, um, he was uh, four years old, and we all went to the mamad, uh, the uh, the, the this protecting uh, room in Israel, and it was a very scary experience then. And here he's not four years old, but he is a father to a one year old son. And we again are in the same situation. This time, like it's the second time when I was a father, now I'm a grandfather, he was like a baby, now he's a father to a baby. And we all 15 people uh, stuck in a room, not knowing exactly what happened. This was one take that I had, a very strong one. And then, knowing nothing, it was Simchat Torah, we did not know anything uh, that is happening. I wanted to go to the shul, which is not far away, and the streets of Jerusalem are empty. And this brought me back to the memories of Yom Kippur War. You know, like the you could not see a person outside. And I thought, like, I'm not that old. Twice in my life to have this experience, and now the third time, this was, I felt so bad about the situation, not only for myself, but for the Jewish people in Israel. How many times we have to, to, to go through this? And then I thought to my, about my parents. My parents both are Holocaust survivors, and, you know, they are not young, and they have to see it again. Like the, the constant fear for the life of Jews around, especially in Eretz Israel, that was supposed to uh, give us the protection. Now, I was a soldier in the Lebanon War, the first Lebanon War. Um, it was very different. It was, at least for me, you know, you are trained as a soldier. You really want actually to uh, execute your skills and your knowledge as a soldier. And when you are 18, you don't really think uh, too much about the consequences, uh, the possible consequences. We learned it. We learned it. Unfortunately, I lost uh, in the first Lebanon war more than 10 of my close friends. These are people that I I did the Tironu, the, the, the basic training, and then went through the army. Uh, 
but when you go to the war, I remember the, the sense of excitement. And then like at the end of the week, when we, between Thursday night to Friday morning, lost so many of our friends, close friends. Um, and I have to tell you one thing, which I find quite amazing. I'm in education for many years, and the, the general feeling among, ed, among educators is that like the generations are going down. What I see, what I hear about the young soldiers, about the young people in Israel, shock me in the most positive way. These guys are real heroes. Like, I'm embarrassed uh, when I hear and see their determination. Uh, their attitude, their pride. Uh, and I do believe from the little I know um, and from what I hear from relatives and, and children of friends that are in the army, you know, it's not only the sons anymore, it's even the grandsons of my friends who are in the army. Um, there is a strong feeling among, again, my circles that Israel has to win um, and the cost is justified for the future of the Jewish people. Um, again, unfortunately, we saw many of, of our friends' children um, uh, killed in the, in the war. But nevertheless, the, the courage, the bravery of the parents, of the families, just shock us. We, we honestly cannot understand it from here. Um, and we have to be very proud about the, the people there, the soldiers, and the community here. What I see here, how Jews from all denominations are connected, they care, they uh, donate, they ask questions. You know how many people called me to ask if my family is fine? Yes. And I find it so heartwarming and so Jewish. People that know me very little, that call me to make sure that I'm okay, my family is okay, I find it fantastic. And students in the school, many, many times, they ask me, they know that my family is in Israel, they come to me, Rabbi Gemara, how's your family doing, everyone is fine, can we help in any way? And honestly, it touched my heart. Rabbi, when you went back into the classroom after your return, and you're sitting there in front of the students and the class is about to start, and in your soul, in your heart, and in your mind, you're in Israel, no question about it. What uh, what proceeded to happen within the classroom? What did you say? What did they say? What was the so, feeling? First of all, I'm still teaching Talmud, although I'm a vice principal, and I, most of the day I'm uh, busy with uh, administrative um, uh, stuff. Uh, I'm, uh, I insisted to continue to teach. I, I need to feel the pulse of the students. Um, I, I strongly believe that when you are in education, um, you have to feel what the student feel and yes, to be yeah. part of them and uh, to understand their life better. And um, first of all, every class, I try to start with what happened in Israel. Let's talk a little bit about what happened in Israel. It's a great opportunity for me also to teach them a few modern uh, words in Hebrew, like um, what is um and what is minharot and um, hafchatzot and all kinds of things that can you translate? Can you... Them, they don't have to talk about, but if you read like a, a, an Israeli newspaper, I want them to be familiar with um, many of the, the words that are used there. Rabbi Mechablim are terrorists. Yeah. What were the other words? Minarot are the tunnels. Yes. yes. Um, we sometimes talk about all the abbreviation of Amlach and Lechima, which is like weapons and, uh, you know, uh, ammunition um, and so on. So, but talking about Israel and they see that I care and I don't try to uh, hide it. And I know that they have difficulty because if you don't have a relative, you don't understand like the fear of knocking on the door or something like this. Um, the, so on one hand, of, obviously, I don't want to scare them, but I want to bring this world and these feelings of Kol Israel Arevim, we are all together in this, uh, into the classroom. And uh, I think I find it very meaningful, and I think they, they find it very meaningful. Can you remember any of the interaction that you had with your students here? Uh, they ask many, many questions. 
Like they what? want to know more. That's the most important thing. They try to uh, ask about, like, um, you know, the first day when I came back to class, I asked them, where is Gaza? And you will be quite shocked to know that 85% of our students did not know where is Gaza. And they don't understand how things are working. So they will listen to the news, but they will not understand, like, the 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 fact that Gaza is sandwiched between Egypt and Israel and what are the difficulties, what is the disconnection between the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza. So they want to know. Our students are smart. They want to understand more. And I try to provide them this education. Rabbi, your daughter, um, whom I interviewed a while ago, a couple, probably a couple of years now during COVID, is a nurse in Israel. I'm sorry, her name escapes me. What was her name? Rachel. Yeah, Rachel Rachel lo yeah. Lovely, lovely human being. And she was written up all over the world because essentially she was the very uh, first nurse, if you will, in Israel right. to be with the first COVID victim, an 88-year-old man who was a survivor of the Holocaust. You must have a lot of pride in her and, of course, your other children. What is it like to be an Israeli living in Toronto having your family back in Israel and knowing what's going on during the war? Uh, you know, I, I want to commend my wife, first of all, because she is in touch with every one of my eight children, Ken Irbu, um, every single day, which yeah. is amazing to me because I, I have to admit, I, I couldn't do it. You're a guy. Um, so, You're a guy. So just for, for our audiences, I have four children in Israel. I have two in United States and two here in Toronto. Yes. Um, so my mother, my uh, wife is, is great in it. She's, she keeps touch every day with everyone and make sure that everyone is okay and she knows what's going on with every one of them. Uh, I try to call once a week, maybe twice a week. Uh, and I hear the news from uh, my wife. Um Listen, you know, we are here, we, of course, think about them. Uh, there is no question, and a lot, and we want to know, like, how the grandchildren are doing, because sometimes they have no Beit Sefer or no gun. It, it influences every avenue of life in Israel, and we want to know what happened. At the same time, we are not there to really help, so we have to be, you know, connected and disconnected at the same time, like... Uh, we don't want to give to be the the Eitzah giver, the person who give advice and not really can help uh, physically with everything that is going on. So it's it's a fear. I have to tell you, every phone call early in the morning or later at night is like, no, let's let's not raise the phone because we don't know what happened. Yes, uh, yeah. It's it's a it's a in our mind. We are more afraid of bad news rather than good news. And this yeah. is a very, it's a state of mind that um, is very damaging mentally. Rabbi, you're in a school, you're an administrator in a school, vice principal chat, where uh, which has experienced a bomb threat. Um, our city, I think, has experienced, our Jewish community is experiencing more anti-Semitism or at least a greater feeling of anti-Semitism than perhaps ever in our recent past. It's very, it's very clear that anti-Semitism is growing. It's much more, uh, it's much more felt by uh, many Jews. If you would have asked Jews before October seventh, most of them in Toronto, tell me about your experiences with anti-Semitism. Most of them say, "I don't have any." Right? That's not the same today. Why are we hated so much, the Jewish people, Rabbi? That's a mystery that um, I have no answer to it. To be honest with you, like sociology, uh, sociology see anti-Semitism as a phenomenon that is hard to explain. Um, because if you see the history of anti-Semitism, uh, it's actually contradicting. Uh, sometimes the Jews are too poor, sometimes they are too rich, sometimes they are uh, don't control anything and they are not involved, sometimes they involve too much. Uh, be before they had no land, now they have land, they even hate it even more. I don't think that there is any rationale going into it. I have what I want to believe, uh, that it's a jealousy um, in, a, in a big way. 
Um, the fact that the Jewish community managed to survive 3,700 years, listen, there is no society that managed to do something like this. Um, and it was not that uh, we lived in paradise. We lived uh, under the harshest conditions. And unfortunately, instead of inspiring the world, and people will say, I want to be like these people. Um, listen, I remember my parents. They came with nothing. You know, the most important thing for them was education. I'm sure that Toronto people have the same story. People came from Hungary, from Poland with no money. They wanted only one thing, education to the children, the family. So I always say, you know, to the, when I hear about anti-Semites, I, I say, you know what? You just have to experience one Shabbos. You have to experience one time going to shul and to feel what community is. You are not going to be anti-Semites. But unfortunately, it works mysteriously against us. Um, and, and it's a big mystery to me. But I'll tell you one thing, because I want to focus on the positive side of anti-Semitism, which might be interesting uh, thought. You know, Avrum, I teach like rabbinics and we teach um, our students about Jewish values. Yes. For many of them, they may be happy to learn about it, but nothing happened afterwards. Um, maybe they will be older, they will care more. But to be honest, for many of them, Jewish values is not the center of the world. They see mm -hmm. themselves more like modern Canadians, uh, the people of the greater world. In the last few weeks, we have a little shul in chat. We have a beautiful uh, Shachris Minyan, boy and girl, then we have Mincha. And people leave their tefillin there. And we have lineups of people coming to wear tefillin every single day. And I ask them, what happened? It's nice to see you. And I don't want you to think that I don't want to see you. But tell me, tell me why now you come. They say, we feel... October the 7th was a message to me as a Jew. They don't attack us just because it's another country in the world. And I want to feel connected to it. And I hear it again and again. Yesterday, we had in uh, Orchaim a beautiful um, a lecture by a girl who is a, um, a officer in Tzahal. And she is serving with many chayalot, many uh, female soldiers. And the Shabbat after October the 7th, they came to her, they asked her to light candles together. So, again, not that I try to encourage anti-Semitism in any way, but we have to see how indeed we Jews take the most horrifying experiences and turn them around. Instead of like, oh, I'm afraid to be a Jew. I will try to hide my Jewishness. Some of the reaction is exactly the opposite. They made us more proud of who we are. And we have to recognize and to build on this foundation. I, I don't want my students to be Jews just because the attack of Hamas. But this is a, a fantastic opportunity to ask ourselves this question. Why they hate us? What happened to the Jewish community, wherever you were, if it was in Russia or Poland or Yemen, we always were hated. Why? Let's try to understand what is unique about the Jewish community. And you know what? This is a great hook and a great question that every Jew has to ask himself. Why are we suffering? Rabbi, you alluded to the idea that, uh, you know, it, it's a mystery as to why anti-Semitism exists. Um, and, and from my reading and from my understanding, indeed it is. But my question to you is, and, and also you mentioned, by the way, you mentioned that if the non-Jew would join us for a Shabbat once, they would see what a beautiful people we are and anti-Semitism would shrink. Um, I think it's probably a bit more broad than that, but I happen to agree with you. So let me just build on that for a second. If they came to you and they go, Rabbi Shlomo Gomorrah, we want to put you in charge of uh, turning anti-Semitism around, what, what would you do? Um, first of all, I think we have to learn the history of anti-Semitism. I think it's uh, very, very important uh, to, to understand that it exists. Um, and, you know, 
before I will answer directly your question, one of my greatest concerns um, as an educator in Canada, and this was for many years before the October 7th, was that the survival instinct of the Jewish people in the modern world weaken to a point that um, it presents a danger for the continuity, continuity of the Jewish people. We have wonderful life here in Canada, in the United States and modern uh, countries in Europe. But the fact that we as a community uh, did not have to be challenged by anti-Semitism so people say, see themselves as part of the larger society. And if Chaz Bechalila, I screamed it like 10 years ago and 15 years ago, if Chaz Bechalila thinks will turn around and Jewish history teaches us that overnight things can turn around, are you going to survive the storm? That's a big question. And I always feel the urgent of teaching students about who they are because the storm for me can come from somewhere as a son for holocaust survivor as someone who is really like read a lot about our jewish history i cannot escape the feeling that it might happen if not today maybe tomorrow if not tomorrow maybe in 50 years maybe in 200 years but my responsibility as an educator is to make sure that thousand years down the road there will be continuity. And first of all, it has to be a physical one. And I feel many, many times that some of our students, some of our children, yes. uh, if they tomorrow put on a remote island and have to develop like a Jewish community, they don't know how. And in a way, they are going to find themselves in a remote island. It might be in the middle of Manhattan, but it's still a remote island in terms of what people around you think about you or how they treat you. And if your survival instinct is not strong, I'm very concerned about what will happen to our students. That's that's a big concern. Um, so if you would uh, ask me to train people uh, against anti-Semitism, I will try to understand what was anti-Semitism in different parts of the world. Why in Russia it was one thing? Why in Germany it was a different thing? Um, why in um, a Arab countries it had a different idea? So you have the religious anti-Semitism, you have the national anti-Semitism, you have all kinds of anti-Semitism. They yes. all have different titles and names. So they have to know about it. Uh, and more important than that, I would say, okay, why are we proud to be Jews? despite all the hatred and uh, the people around us who don't like us so much. And I will talk about the amazing fact that they told you that for 3,700 years, mm -hmm. we managed to be a community. I talk a lot about it. I talk about our Hebrew name. You know, you are a room. Like, you are somehow descendant of a person that you know that you are his descendant, Avram Avinu. I'm Shlomo, like after King Solomon. And I talk to the boys and the girls, what's your Hebrew name? And you yes. know that these Hebrew names existed like thousands of years ago. You yes. are connected. You are connected. And they find even something as small as this one so profound. Mm -hmm. They feel that in, in moment they part of a, a very long chain uh, through the history. We talk about the Jewish community, our strengths, tzedakah. Um, you know, I'll give you one example of anti-Semitism that uh, existed in Europe. You know, they always talked about um, secret fund that every Jew um, uh, that is going through uh, financial stress is the rich people who control the world, of course, they are going to find a, a way to give him money and to build a business. You wouldn't believe, by the way, how many people until this very moment think like this. Mm -hmm. I just look for this person who is going to help me to build the business. But let's forget about this one. Um, but the reason was very, very simple. You go even today to Rome. You know, in Rome, on the streets of Rome, you are going to see people drunk. 
look terrible, dirty, filthy, really terrible. I think you don't have to go to Italy. There are some uh, places in, in the United States, Baruch Hashem, not in Canada yet, that you see people in the bottom, bottom of, of uh, the social uh, uh, structure. And, and they look awful and no one cares really about them. It never existed in the Jewish community. If a person broke, if a person had all kinds of issues, the community immediately helped him to uh, keep his dignity, to make sure that uh, his children uh, have food on the table, uh, that a certain level of tzedakah is always kept. And this by itself is a reason, unfortunately, for anti-Semitism because the Jews are different, but they don't understand they are different in the ability of every person to care about the other one. And this is something that, unfortunately, in the general community does not exist as in the Jewish community. So they see us as separate. Again, my best advice to a counter um, anti-Semitism is just to show them how much they could learn from the from Jewish life and to adapt it to unprivileged communities. They could change the course of their life if they would just try to learn what are the secrets of Jewish survival. And unfortunately, instead of learning, they turn it against us. And this is very... Well, would you teach Torah to the non-Jew? Absolutely, yes. I know that the halacha say that, you know, you cannot teach, but I think that certain things we must teach, actually. Like what? The non-Jews. I'm sorry? Like what? Um, yeah, it's the stories of the Bible. I have to say, listen, they learn it too. Uh, but with the message, the real message of the complexity of, of the human being and what God wants us as a good society. Not everyone has to be Jew. But, you know, according to us, everyone has to keep the seven mitzvot of Bnei Noach, which by themselves are making a wonderful community. We have to be on a higher level. But really what God wants is a perfect world that treat everyone nicely and with respect and dignity and his rights. And I would see no problem to, um, of course, in a lachika way, um, we don't try to convert the world to Judaism. That's not the purpose here. But to teach them why are we unique? What gave such a strength to the Jewish communities over the centuries? I think it will be wonderful if we develop actually curriculum for this. Rabbi, about uh, four and a half years ago now, I started to learn Gemara Talmud, and I did uh, within the what's called the Daf Yomi cycle. And essentially that was started in 1928, and it was predicated on the idea that if people learn one page back and front for about seven and a half years, that they can complete all the tractates of the Talmud. Since I started learning, I must tell you, as you said before, I've become much prouder as a Jew. I think that I have a much better basis of understanding for Torah, uh, although very, very little, uh, than I did prior to um, starting Daf Yomi. And what I found within the Talmud, within the Gemara, they're synonymous, is the strength of logic. It is the strength of storytelling, Agarata, and the back and forth as we are known for the Jewish people, right? Elu vi elu, this is right, and this is right, and this is right, all within a given context. Sometimes, Rabbi, I'm learning Talmud, and I start to laugh. <laughs> because I start to laugh, literally, out loud. I go, oh my gosh, what a shita, what a position this Rabbi is taking. This is so bizarre, it's so out there, but I understand why he is doing it to make his point dramatic. Then, as preparation for this interview, I, I started to read up on Shai Agnon who is considered to be one of the finest uh, literary giants of the Jewish world, but not only the Jewish Wait, world, the world I, I in general. Yeah, yeah, go, go. There. Stop me there, Rabbi. Stop me there. Shai Agnon, I consider him to be apparently not the, Jew, the greatest Jewish writer of all times, yeah. but I would put him in the first five great writers in the same level of... 
Shakespeare. Shakespeare? Uh, with no question, I think he's better, by the way, honestly. I'm completely biased with Shai Agnon. I have to say that. But I think that everyone who is able to read Shai Agnon in Hebrew will have to join uh, with me, that he was the giant of all. Okay, Even Rabbi. Let, and I know let, Shakespeare a little bit. Let, let me break in for a second. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, That's I don't right. like when people say one of the greater Jewish writer. No, he was one of the okay. greatest writer ever. Okay. So my question to you is as follows. You are passionate lover of Gomorrah, of Talmud, right? I know we've talked about it. There have been articles written about you, and you say that it is one of the fundamental things that we need to learn and to teach our children. The complexity of it helps us grow as a people. Um it's, it's probably one of the survival things that, you know, I remember reading in Rabbi Steinzeltz's book, uh, The Essence of Talmud. He says in communities where Talmud no longer existed, where it was not taught anymore, that community dissipated. That community went away. So my question to you is, Agnon, from what I can see, the reason why people love Agnon so much is because he's the extension of the Talmud. That, uh, you know, Jeffrey Sachs, who 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 edited uh, stories by Agnon, he said, if you read Agnon and you think that you're reading about a Hasidic shtetl somewhere, then you're not reading him correctly. You have this depth I'm of Agnon that you have the depth of the Talmud. Is it safe to say that you're attracted to both of those pretty much for the same reasons? That's a wonderful analysis of room. I have to commend you for this one. Uh, and I want maybe to build uh, a little bit upon what Jeffrey Sachs, uh, now is a doctor, uh, and his contribution to the world of Agnon is just beyond any expectations. Like known in many, many circles, like people don't hear about him, they don't read him, and Jeffrey Sachs brought it back to life. Now, uh, yeah, fantastic. Okay, um, what is the Gemara? And here is the point, because I'm sure that when you were um, seven, eh, not seven, but, you know, nine, ten years old, you started maybe to open a Gemara, especially uh, with your background. But you are excited about the Gemara when you are already an adult person with experience. What happened in between? So here is the point. You cannot excite children, even 12 or 14, about questions of a goat that jumped off the roof and <laughs> broke some keli. Now, it's just like a goat. He doesn't know what is a goat. He's like, what keli, what damage, what are you talking about? It's oh, yeah. so removed from his work. And nevertheless, a talented, talented teacher will take it a completely different avenues and they will start to ask the students things that they really care about and you know i'll give you one example if we we still have some time we have time rabbi okay. i part of my job is to go to evaluate teachers and to talk to them how they can improve their their classes so I went one to a biology, uh, biology uh, class and I hear the teacher talk about the blood circulation in the body. And, you know, like after five minutes, he lost them all. They don't care anymore about the blood and circulation and so on. So I told the teacher, can I, can I just ask the students one question? And I asked them, who was injured recently? And like half the class jumping, me, I cut my finger, I cut my leg. And yeah, what happened? like the blood gush out, and I ask them, why? Why the, why the blood gushed out? And at this point, I say to the teacher, you now explain them. And he say to me, like, what happened here? Like, they, I lost them, and I said, because the blood circulation does not touch their personal, they don't care about it. But when you talk about something that they care about, they listen. Very good. And this is very true also about Talmud. If you teach about like one ox goring the other one, that's not interesting. But if you teach about responsibility of a person to guard his property, when you talk about how careful you have to be 
towards your neighbor, um, another person, uh, and so on, you frame it in a very different way that really interests the student because issues of someone broke something of them and a, a debate, should he pay for it or he shouldn't, it's your fault, it's my fault, this is part of the world. And what is a Talmud? Part of the world. So once you have the teacher who managed to bring the laws into a story, into something that touched their heart and mind, the picture is very, very different. Agnon, I don't think it's extension of the Talmud, but I'll tell you what why Agnon is so important for me and why I think every Jew should read Agnon. Listen, our life are complicated. Let's be honest. On one hand, Agnon grew up in a cheder. He grew up, he was a huge Talmud Chacham. He knew the entire Torah. But at the same time, he saw the modern world and was confused. He went through the First World War. He went through the Second World War. Can you really grow as a Jew if you don't ask your question, or yourself question? What happened in the Holocaust to the Jewish people? What happened to the world in the First World War? How Cain again can kill Hebel uh, and, you know, the world continue to, to go on? There are so many questions that to be a real Jew, I'm not talking about the people who imitate their parents, but a real Jew cannot be and cannot grow if he does not ask this hard question. And that non, I'm not saying answer the question, but he caused you to think from different angles. That's what makes him such a great writer. He brings to the surface the big question of Jewish existence, try to explain it, try to give you some reflection on it. You can agree, you can disagree, you can hate it sometimes, you can love it sometimes, but it inspires you to think about your existence as a Jew. That's why I love it. So in this regard, Agnon does not tell the story of Shtetl. He tells the story of the Jewish DNA. And if you really understand it, if you put the, the, the Jewish existence under the microscope, Agnon gives you such a good microscope to see the beauty, sometimes the not-so-beauty sides of Jewish existence, and to me, it's very, very inspiring. And that's why people love Agnon. Uh, we have here the Chug Agnon. You know, I don't want to be a salesperson, but this is such a wonderful Chug that exists for dozens of years. Uh, people are coming and we deal with this very question. The Jewish existence, why people are hating us, what can we do about it? Uh, what is the uh, status of Medinat Israel in the... A entire fabric that we call Jewish uh, history. And Agnon raised many, many questions, give very profound answers. That's why I love Agnon. I'm going to read you two pieces right now, and I want you to tell me if there's a correlation between the two. The first piece that I'm going to read you is from uh, Midrash Tanhuma in Naso, the tractate Naso. And it's a short piece of Agarata. It's a very short story. It's very shocking. And then I'm going to read you a few lines from a story that I just read in preparation for our interview today called Forevermore. You're familiar with the story? Uh, who wrote it? So it's Agnon. It's called Forevermore. And it's with... Um, I have to tell you, I have difficulty with the translation of Agnon oh, okay. to English. So you will read it to me. I hope uh, I will recognize I, it. I think it's Ad, Ola, Ad HaOlam, forever, or Mashuk, something okay. like that. Anyways, it's a fascinating story. But let me just tell you the Agarata first. You can comment on it by yourself or together with the Agnon piece. A story is told of two sisters who resembled one another. One sister was married and lived in one city. And the other sister was married and lived in another city. The husband of one of them grew jealous of his wife, and he wanted to bring her to Jerusalem to drink the bitter waters. And remember, this is in the Talmud. Yeah. Yeah. That sister went to the city where her sister lived with her husband, and her sister said to her, Why did you see fit to come here? She said to her, My husband wants me to drink the bitter waters. Her sister said, I will go in your stead and drink. She said to her, Go. She dressed herself in her sister's clothes and went in her stead. 
She drank the bitter waters and was found to be innocent. She returned to the home of her sisters who came out happily to greet her. She embraced her sister and she kissed her on the lips. When they kissed one another, her sister breathed in the smell of the bitter waters and immediately she died. You familiar with that, Agata? I, of course, yeah. What's your reaction to that story? It's Yal Kuchimoni. Well, as I always say, the stories of the Talmud, many of them never happened. Yeah. The purpose of the story is a very profound message uh, into a Jewish thought. So I'm not saying that this story never happened. But if it happened or not, it does not make any difference to me. I have, I have to, be, to admit, uh, you know, this, this point. Um, how do you understand the main point of the story here? I think one of the things I take out of it is the love between uh, uh, sisters. The That's love between siblings. Because my, uh, sis- my sister passed away, uh, Naomi, Hachda, two, three years already. Yes. And uh, I see what it's like. Rabbi Shaim told me, he said some of the most difficult funerals that he's gone to is funerals of siblings because they're with us all of our lives. She was willing to risk her life. She knew that she wouldn't die because she did not, you know, uh, was not with another man. But the other thing, too, it's shocking. And I've read this to other people, Rabbi. They found the the end of it so shocking that, in fact, she had slept with somebody else. And therefore, when she drank the bitter waters from the lips of her sister, she died. And and I think that that that, that the idea that she she drank it through her sister's lips through love is really such a powerful piece. And I agree with you. I think. You know, to me, this story, again, I did not have enough time to prepare myself to analyze the story, but I'll tell you what I think is the idea behind the story. What what our sages, when they wrote this story, what they wanted to emphasize, I believe. Listen, we, we do many, many things in Jewish life, which seems to be like ceremonies. Um, the whole story of Sota and drinking the water is kind of a ritual. It's a, it's a ceremony you take to the Beit HaMikdash and so on and so on. And you know, sometimes Jewish life is centered around the rituals and around the ceremonies. And we forget a little bit like the meaning, the yeah. profound meaning of, of the ritual. What are we really doing here? Netilat Yadaim is more than Netilat Yadaim. It's like preparing the body to something holy because for us, Shabbat meal is something holy, and you have to elevate yourself in order to do it. That's washing your hands, right? Exactly. Like, it prepares you to, to a certain mental state that elevates you from the ordinary to something more holy. I think that the story of Mesota, you might think, okay, the Torah here has like an ancient polygraph uh, to see if a person is uh, saying the truth or not. And it's one way to look at it um, uh, because it looks like the Torah had a trick uh, to realize if she slept with another person or not. But I think our sages were opposing to this idea that it's just like a ritual and you can uh, somehow trick the ritual because it's a Jewish mind. Like, why should I go? My sister will go and she will do it and you outsmart the system. And I think this Midrash, this story yeah. comes yeah. to say, mm-hmm. you don't understand, it's not about the ritual. There is something profound. And if a person, if a woman slept with another one, God knows it very well. Now, you know, normally the ritual comes to find out. But if you will think that you manage to trick the ritual and to outsmart it, I have great news for you. God is there and in a very ironic way, set justice in the right place. Very good. I like that. So that's that's the way I read it. But Rabbi, Rabbi, just to go off uh, for a second here, you you believe in God, obviously. Of course. With all your heart and mind, you do know there's a God? 100%. You don't question question it at all. You know what? Listen, I have to tell you what I tell to my students. And listen, this is very, very important. Do you know this? uh, There is a new art where when you look at the picture, you see nothing. 
And then when you uh, put your eyes in a certain um, a yeah. position, you squint. You see inside all kinds of things that you don't see the first place, right? Yeah, yeah. You know this art, I can't remember, it's 3D illusion. I can't remember the name of it. But you, you can see it in many museums and some artists are doing amazing things with it. And I tell my students, you know, you see this? No, you don't see anything. But if you train your eyes, you start see it. You know, people want to see God right away. Like, and they don't see anything. They say, no God. I can say about myself that many times I feel that I train my eyes to see God in places where other people don't see them. And mm -hmm. again, I don't want to brag Chaz Khalila because, you know, what I would say, I, I try to believe in God. I try to find God in everything that I'm doing every day and the help that he sent me or the warning that he sent me. Listen, I, I don't think that a person can say I'm such a righteous person. I always like only in the shadow of God. I'm not. But I try. I try my best. And I find that if we are tuned well, we will see God in our everyday life and and you ask you know this is maybe a good way to tie together what we started to speak about like this moment that my grandfather decided to leave his daughter behind yes i of course you can say you know it just happened and i, I can understand the person who will say that i see here an involvement of god in the decision that a, a person is doing um, so as I said, like realizing God in our life, you have to be a little bit trained and to try to see God and he will show himself to you if you just try to do it right. Okay. I want to go to the next piece here, which is reading a piece from Magnon. The story is called Forevermore. I think it's called in Hebrew, Ad, Ad Ha Olam. How would you say? Yeah. It's a very famous, uh, modern story of Magnon, by the way. Yeah. And, and it's a lead story in this book. Uh, which is edited by Jeffrey Sachs. I don't know if you can see that. And I read it, and it's a fascinating story. I just want to read a couple paragraphs, and I want to hear your response to the form of it and maybe some of the content. For 20 years, Adiel Amza, I noticed with Agnon, he uses alliterations a lot for his names, right? right? Worked on his history of the great city of Gamlita. Uh, Gamlita. Gamlita, which never existed, right? Yeah. The pride of mighty nations until it was reduced to dust and ashes by the Gothic hordes and its peoples enslaved. After he had gathered all his research together, examined and tested them, sorted, edited, and arranged them, he decided that his work was finally ready for publication, and he sat down and wrote the book he had planned for so many years. He took the book and made rounds of the publishers, but without success. He looked uh, about for patrons and benefactors, but he had no luck. During all the years he had been occupied with his research, he had not taken the trouble to integrate himself with the learned men of the universities, not with their wives and not with their daughters. And now when he came to them seeking a favor, their eyes shone with such cold anger that their glasses seemed to warp. Who are you, sir? They said, we've never seen you before. So I'm going to stop here, but it's a wonderful story. And you know what I was thinking? How true, he, how true it is what he was saying, that here in, in the Jewish community, you have to know the players. You have to interact with them. If you don't, you can only get so far in terms of what your goals are. What do you think about what, what Agnon wrote there? Uh, listen, this is one of the hardest stories of Agnon. Um, you know, I, I'll give you one example. And here is why I say that it's very, very hard to translate Agnon. Because, yeah. for example you are going to see that Adiel Amza, the person that starts with Ein and Ein, right? And then you talk about Gumaldeta, and I think that uh, Agnon in his book, uh, if I'm not uh, mistaken, he describes the city Ir Gdola, Ir, which is start in Hebrew in the Ot Ein again, Gdola, Gimel, which is like Gea, like proud of itself, um, a proud uh, city, a proud city. Yeah, so the entire story is about people that start with Ein and Gimel. You are going to see that, and you will, you might find it uh, very interesting that Agnon is also Ein Gimel, Agnon, right? So, 
and you know, just to explain oh, yeah. this right. idea right. of Ayn and Gimel in Agnon, in Hebrew, Ag, like Uga, is something which is round. And Agnon see himself, again, as I said before, the discoverer of the Jewish DNA, because it's always the same. Like our Jewish history is not going at the linear line, but more like a spiral line that is like round and round and round. So uh, what exactly Agnon meant, many, many people believe that uh, Gumal Deta, and think about the two words, is Gamul and Dat, Gumal Deta. Like it's like that uh, religion. It's a person that was, it's, it's a city that was freed and fettered from religious commitment. And that's how we saw, by the way, uh, Rome or the Nazis, people who are free from um, the, the religions of God, the, the main value that all uh, society, all humanity has to uh, behave like. Uh, some people see it more like about the Jewish community. I don't know. I think that the story was published in 45 or 46, right after the Second World War. So maybe it's more universal than like just Jewish thing. But there is no question that Agnon criticized the structure of the Jewish villages, social structure, before the Holocaust. Uh, this is not a, a, a lesson about Agnon, but Agnon in his stories saw what is coming. And part of it was obviously, you know, not part. The main part came from uh, obviously the, the anti-Semites and the Nazis and the other uh, collaborated with the Nazis. But Agnon like our sages in the second uh, uh, temple, saw the problem in the Jewish community is also responsible to some of what happened. Now, I don't want to release any, any uh, blame from the people who killed us. I don't want to victimize Chazbe Khalila, my, my grandparents and, and them. But there were problems with the Jewish community, and you raise one of them, that sometimes the mobility uh, in the Jewish community might be hard if you are not connected to the right people. Agnon talk about this problem. That's why I'm so intrigued to Agnon, because he sees a big picture and is very honest to tell you, you know, we had our issues. These issues still exist, and we have to deal with them, and we have to solve them if we want to ensure better future to our children and grandchildren. And your interpretation is good as mine. Uh, that's the beauty of good literature because everyone read it uh, the way he experienced his own life. And the moment he published to the public, it's not the author anymore. It's, it's our book. Rabbi, you're talking about how letters are used uh, very often in the Torah or you see in our prayers, a shetchayel alebed gimel dalet. I want to read you something. We're going to wrap up the interview. We're going to Bring this circle full. So I want to state this, and then I have one more question to ask you. Rav Chaim Loi, who was the brother of the famed Maharal of Prague, explained that Talmud study is a form of spiritual protection. This is alluded to by the word Gemara, like your name, Gabriel. which is an act. Th this is the this is alluded to by the word Gemara, which is an acronym for the four hosts of angels, each one headed by the archangels who sing God's praises and surround the person to save him from harm. Gimel, Gavriel, Michael is the Mem, Raphael is the Reish, and Uriel is the Aleph. And when you take them all, it spells the word Gemara. Did, did you ever, ever heard such a thing? It's very interesting. I heard this one. I, I can tell you another one. Yeah, tell me okay, another one. Okay. Ask me your question. I will answer your question with a with a funny story. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So my question is: We used to have our best talk conversations after davening when we come out of shul at Mincha Marv on Friday night. I have to start going back to shul so I can have some of those talks with you. And I remember when we were schmoozing, um, Rome came up and your fascination with ancient Rome. And you said you wanted to know more about it, so you went to Italy and you became a Roman tour guide. Now I must tell you when I when I when I thought about bringing you on the show when I think about you as a friend and as a person 
I'm really fascinated by those twists and turns in your life. Not too many people would be so interested in Rome that they would become a tour guide. So tell me about that. Okay. Uh, the truth is I didn't go to Rome to become like a tour guide. I actually went with my wife to Rome and we fell in love with Rome. Um, right. And I'll right. tell you why in a second. Um, and then when COVID hit and we wanted to go again to Rome, we couldn't because, as you remember, like no one, no flights were from Toronto to Rome and elsewhere. Uh, I decided that I don't give up my love to Rome. And I took a course with the University of London um, uh, of being a tour guide in Imperial Rome, which I was more interested. So, you know, I'm not sure that I know about all the new buildings in Rome, but I can take you to a very interesting uh, uh, visit on the Palatine Hill, on the um, uh, the fields uh, outside Rome, the pyramid, the catacombs of Rome. Very, very interesting. Um, yeah, and um, after... Uh, 16 weeks, I got um, a license to be a tour guide in Rome. Unfortunately, I cannot be a tour guide, a real tour guide, because the Italians are not stupid. They don't let other people with uh, different nationality to be a tour guide in their country. But they'll so, teach the uh, course. So I, I can lead myself. And you know what? It's really interesting. It's more for <laughs> myself. Not only that, actually, a few <clears throat> months ago, uh, because the catacombs and the st uh, gravestones in Rome are so important to understand what happened, um, I took 101 uh, Latin also. Um, I, I passed it with reasonable mark, like 74 or something like this. But I wanted, uh, because Latin is a very difficult language, let me tell you, I didn't know that it's that uh, difficult language. And um, yeah, um, and I'll tell you what I think. Yes. Why why Rome fascinating me? Because I do believe with all my heart that only Jews understand what Rome stood for. And I'll explain you what I mean. The first time we went with a professor from university um, in our first trip, she was a very lovely lady, and she explained about Rome, and we go to the Titus Ark and to the um, Coliseum and to the Palatine uh, Hill, um, and it was very interesting. And then it hit me something very interesting. I said, you know, for you, it's all history. But for me, it's life. I said, you see, I'm not shaved. It was in the time between Yudzain Betamuz and Tisha B'Av, where Orthodox Jews don't shave. And, uh, you know, they are mourning the Churma. And I said, you know, for me, Titus, name like Ta Titus, uh, uh, Vespasian, uh, oh, Hadrian, for me, these are people that, has connection to my current situation. For me, it's not history. And she looked at me in the beginning in, in a complete amazement. Like she didn't understand what I'm talking about. Yes, and yes. as I explained it to her, you know, after like two hours tour, you know what she told me? I think I'm going to buy a ticket and to go and visit Israel. That's what she said. Because it was the first time that she understood that what Rome did to the world is much more than just architecture and bridges and amazing uh, buildings. There is something in the culture that we Jews opposed and only the people who opposed it understand what Rome actually represents. And therefore, every time that I go or read, and I, I read quite a lot about Rome, it comes to me clearer and clearer I am a descendant of a person who fought against the Roman culture. What? And listen, I am today alive. I know the connection to my ancestors. These guys have no idea. Let me tell you one story, which is amazing and very inspiring. To become a Roman, you have to know seven generations of your uh, ancestors who lived in Rome. There is one family, I think the Rossini family in Rome, that they relate themselves to Julius Caesar. There are 17 families in Rome from the Jewish community who know that they came as slaves, they were freed later, from Jerusalem. They carry the name. You know these people are like the descendants of the people who arrived from Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. They are the real Romans. So you go to Rome, 
you have one Roman family and you have 17 Jewish Roman real families. Mm -hmm. I found it so inspiring and amazing. And that's why I really love to tell people about Rome and, and everything that the Roman did, but the Jews knew to take the beautiful thing that Rome brought to the world, but to reject completely some of their ideas and, and um, way of life. You know, Rabbi, what I'm taking away from what you're saying is there's a whole lot to unpack, but, but what essentially you're saying is that we have a living history. We have a breathing history. It's not essentially studying histrionics, right? We're knowing the Absolutely. dates and knowing the time and knowing the characters. Now, I want you to know that you're mechaving to Agnon, and I'm going to read something to Agnon from, from Agnon to you. He said, as a result of the historic catastrophe in which Titus of Rome destroyed Jerusalem and Israel, uh, he said, I was, uh, I was exiled from the land. He says about himself, I was born in one of the, into one of the cities of the exile, but always I regarded myself as one who was born in Jerusalem. This is what he said. Now, I want to continue. You have a few more minutes for me? By the way, you should know this word that you are now quoting. He said when he got the Nobel Prize in Stockholm, in Sweden, this is the beginning of his lecture to all the people. Yes. And he speak about himself as the Levi who sing the song of Jerusalem to the Jewish people. So yeah, you're, jump, you're, you're, ju you're jumping ahead. By the way, his 1966 speech for the Nobel Prize is in this book. So it behooves people to ah, buy this okay, book. Great. Listen what Agnon said. Listen to what he said. In a dream, in a vision of the night, I saw myself standing with my brother Levites, because he was a Levi, right? Right. In the Holy Temple, singing with them the songs of David, King of Israel, melodies such as no ear had heard since the day our city was destroyed and its people went into exile. I suspect that the angels in charge of the shrine of music, fearful lest I sing in wakefulness what I had sung in dream, made me forget by day what I had sung at night. For if my brethren, the sons of my people, were to hear, they would be unable to bear their grief over the happiness that they have lost. To console me for having prevented me from singing with my mouth they enable me to compose songs in writing. Now, Rabbi, here, here's my question to you. It seems like Agnon felt that in some way his writing was prophetic. Absolutely. Yeah, what do you mean by absolutely? Tell me about that. Absolutely. Listen, again, Avrum, you, when you talk about Agnon, I can tell you so much, and I feel that the time uh, is doing it's limited, yeah. It. But I would say the following. Agnon, uh, many, many times, uh, saw himself as not, I, I would not say a prophet, but I would say like a continuation of King David, who wrote the beautiful um, uh, Psalm of Tehillim and express the tie between living history, as you called it, and the connection and protection of God of the Jewish people. This beautiful piece that you, you read, and you know, every time I, I hear it, I am just about to cry because this is such a beautiful position that he takes. I continue 1,800 years after the Levim are no more around us. I continue their job. Uh, he did see himself as a person who brings together the entire Jewish history to one place. And that's why he was very concerned about what Israel is going to be. You know, we are in difficult days now in Israel. Is Israel is a Jewish state? Is it just like a national state? How can we bridge it? He was very skeptical about it. This is a, a whole different story. We can talk about this one uh, for hours and hours. Um, but he saw himself absolutely as what he called himself, like the Sofer and the Chazan. He saw that he is writing the history of the past connected to the uh, present and the future. Um, and he was. Actually, he was. Everyone who read his stories and learn them uh, will get such an insight into our past and our possible future with all the concern around it. And uh, I think he lacked the prophecy of knowing what will happen, although I think 
he was a believer Jew and believed in the future of the Jewish people. Um, but, you know, the prophets did not just prophesy about the future. They, they brought the word of God to the nation. And in this way, I think that's what Agnon tried to do. He wanted to bring the word of God um, to the Jewish people after the first and the second war, uh, wars. Uh, world wars, and also to give them some ideas, thoughts, questions, may, possible answers about how the Jewish existence will continue in Eretz Israel. Tell me something. Do you write? I wish. Why don't you? I don't feel that I really can add something to the... I don't feel that I can add something significant to the Jewish people. I, I, I could write, obviously, but let's take like people like Rabbi Sachs. He brought something unique, original, authentic. What, what am I going to bring? Just like, uh, you know, repeating ideas that were said by much greater people like I am. I, I feel very unworthy, honestly. You know, you know Rabbi... No, <laughs> who he... Who, who he is. And I don't feel that I can bring like something uh, completely new to the world. And if Hashem gives me here and there like a good Bar Torah, that's very nice. But it doesn't make me worthy of adding something to the sea of knowledge and, and greatness of Jewish culture. Okay. I mean, I'm, I'm obviously going to have to disagree with you because I think what you do in our interview and in our discussions together and all the many classes that you give, you're not simply pulling together ideas. What you're doing is you're pulling together in such a way that people can see patterns. And I think that's what life is all about. That's what Torah is all about. I mean, you're brilliant, brilliant at it. So I'll have to argue with you, but I, I, I will tell you that when Eric Clapton and Jeff Beck and all the great guitarists who started out in the 60s one night they went out to watch Jimi Hendrix play guitar. At the end of the evening, they went home, they put their guitars away, and they said, there's no reason for us to play guitar anymore. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> I understand that point of view. I do. I've heard it from wow. other people. And I often think of that myself when I'm, when I'm sitting down to write is, yeah, what do I have to add? But I will tell you as a dear friend and someone who loves you, uh, who feels very strongly about who you are, I, I think that you'd benefit the world an awful lot by writing something on Agnon and maybe comparing it to the Talmud. You know, who knows? Who knows? Anyway, so Rab- I want to thank you so much. It was a lovely schmooze. A yeah, lovely room, schmooze. Thank you very, very much for your time. Again, I, I wonder why you brought me. And I hope that maybe I, we learned something new together today. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, and I do want to tell all, all my viewers and listeners that um, the show today was dedicated to the soldiers of the uh, IDF, but not only to them, to the mothers and the fathers and all the families who sit down and constantly worry, constantly worry about how their dear children are, how our brothers and sisters are in Israel. I'll tell you in short, I have a cousin who many years ago, her son was in the army and it was during one of the wars and it was Friday night and a wind came in through a window and it blew out her Shabbos candles. And she couldn't be consoled, Rabbi. She couldn't be consoled. She thought something, God forbid, had happened to her son. But it hadn't, thank God. But that, that is the road that the, our Israeli brothers and sisters are on. Like I always say, when we send our kids to, to university at 18, the, the Israeli mothers and fathers are sending their children to the IDF to fight for us. Sure. So God bless them. They should be well. Right. And we, we have to thank them profusely profusely from our hearts for not only fighting for Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel, but for fighting for every single Jew everywhere. Right, Rabbi? I completely agree with you. You know, uh, at this moment, um, I'll tell you a short story again. Uh, we have in chat um, a couple shlichim, uh, the Mayorman family. Emissaries, um, messengers from Israel. Yeah. And Shira, that's uh, the, the female uh, in the couple, she lost her brother about three weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, he actually came to Toronto. He married um, a, a girl who actually was born in Toronto. Um, and they, she made Aliyah and she married this wonderful, wonderful boy. I met him uh, last Rosh Hashanah, this Rosh Hashanah, actually. Uh, he came to Daven here. And he was he was killed with his friend um, about three weeks ago. Um, 
the parents, a very esteemed family in Israel, um, they came, they are now in Toronto uh, because Shira gave uh, birth to a daughter. And to me, it's the most um, moving part of the Jewish existence. We can go from a state of devastation and destruction uh, to give it a meaning in order to build a new generation stronger, closer to his nation, to the land and to Hashem. And hopefully this is just one story out of hundreds now, unfortunately. Uh, and Benad Hashem, hopefully Hashem will give all the soldiers, all the people of Israel and us the strengths and the powers to grow from it. And it always happened in Jewish history. I'm Yisrael Chai, the Nation of Israel lives. Thank you so much for listening to the Avram Rosenzweig Show. It's a podcast with fascinating people who have very inspiring stories, and we look forward to being with you once again next week. Golak Avod, Rabbi, thank you so much for being with me, and uh, to all of our listeners and viewers, take care. Thank you.